Well, hello, hello everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, as you know, we are here at the Sync Up Conference, which is a program of the Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which is the nonprofit organization that owns Jazz Fest and uses the proceeds from that event for year-round programming in the areas of education, economic development, and culture. Um, welcome to the Jazz and Heritage Center, uh, where we are pleased to host the Sync Up Conference. This is our second annual event, and we are really thrilled to have this panel going on, which I think is going to be very instructive for a lot of us. Just want to remind everyone, in case you are not already aware, that when you are out at Jazz Fest, we do have the Sync Up Hospitality Area. It's located on the third floor of the Grandstand Building behind the Music Heritage Stage. So if you're out at the festival, please come and join us. And uh, have a have a cold beverage and relax and get to meet some of your new friends. Um, this panel is about how independent artists can break into the festival market, especially the international festival market. We talked yesterday about the international festival market in a larger scale, and we asked some similar questions. And the reason for it is that, as you all know, artists in this region tend to be independent. Most of us don't have booking agents and managers and publishers and record labels and attorneys and all of the other people who help bring the creative folks to the larger marketplace. And yet, there are a number of artists in our midst who are independent and are still able to break through and able to gain footholds in the touring world, in the festival market, and are able to achieve significant success. And I'll tell you that the inspiration for this panel in particular came about uh, with a conversation with Christian Kuffner here from the, from the Zydepunks. He and I were standing on uh, St. Claude Avenue one Saturday evening when it was gallery night and all the, the uh, galleries were having their openings and we were chatting and he was telling me about all these festivals that he had been playing and I thought, wow, you guys are doing this all on your own. It would be really helpful for other people to know how you've managed to get into this world. And truth be told, maybe it's not always the, um, the North Seas or you know, the, the gigantic Jugundo festivals, the, the Coachellas of the world that we think of, uh, but it is important work, and it's important work for an artist, especially an independent artist. Bruce Sunpai Barnes, who is also with us today, has also achieved significant success in this area on, on his own terms. Gary Edwards, who, who is to Bruce's right, is um, somebody who has connected many, many local artists with festival opportunities throughout the world, and I want him to tell us a little bit about how he approaches those things. And Dave Margulies, who is an old friend and big time supporter of New Orleans, going back to his days at Tulane University, umpty ump years ago. Uh, you wear it well. Um, and he is also the uh, producer, co-producer, of the High Sierra Music Festival in Northern California, uh, which is um, what I would call one of those mid-range festivals. It's not Coachella, but it's still an important event that attracts a lot of people. And so you hire a lot of independent bands, including a lot of bands from this region. So I think we have a really great panel of folks who can tell us about their experiences and shed some light on how you can achieve similar success. So it, it, since Christian was the one who inspired uh, this panel, if I could just ask you to talk a little bit about how the band came together, how you got here, and then tell us how you began to approach festivals and how, how your initial successes came about, because I'm sure once you get one, that helps to get the next and helps right. to get the next. So tell you how you broke into that whole thing. Right. That's a lot of questions, though, all at once. Um, we formed about five years ago. It was more of a project just where we were a couple of street performers and it just slowly gelled. We got new members and we did a little tour in the southeast and we just had a lot of fun, so we continued with our band. And initially, the way we approached festivals is only to book here in the city because we hadn't really played anywhere outside and you know it's easier to build yourself up locally, obviously, than anywhere else. So. I can't even remember the first festival we played at. It might have been Voodoo Fest or French Quarter Festival, but it was just playing locally, you know, um, is something to show for when you start to book outside of town. You can say, yes, we've played all these festivals in our local region. And then it slowly grew from there. We've had, um, we've played with 
other bands that have helped us in their markets, book festivals outside of here. We've had um, venues that we've contacted in other cities, like in Augusta and in Hattiesburg, that help promote festivals there. So once you have a good touring uh, schedule and you have good contacts in these other cities, it's helped us a lot to book festivals that way. We haven't even done any of the work, especially in Hattiesburg, for example, at the Thirsty Hippo. The club owner there has been like, you know, you can, do you want to play this festival? Do you want to play this festival? We've had three pretty large gigs just because they booked it for us. Um, and then, let's see. Well, how, so how did they, I mean, so had you, you had booked a club gig in Hattiesburg? Yeah, the, we actually got introduced to that club first through Mike West and Truck Stop Honeymoon, and then it just slowly built from there because that club's a little particular. So they don't, they don't like to have anybody call them or book them, so you have to go through somebody else to get in there in the first place. And so, so tell us about that. Do you, you don't remember the, the, the very first festival that you played, but can you talk about... Well, probably Voodoo Fest, I think. Really? Yeah. So right how did that one come about? Um, there's some people who book one of the smaller stages there called the New Moon Stage, and they book, they like to bring in any new local band. And at the time we were new, so they just brought us in. It was the first festival after Katrina, actually. Now you do all your own bookings, right? Pretty much. In Europe, we have help. Um, we used to have, a, a, we have a new agent now, but mm -hmm. we used to have an agent based out of um, Antwerp, and now we have one in Amsterdam. Um, well, t talk about that. How did you how did you connect they with found a European us. The European agent? The agent in Antwerp found us. I don't know how. He says he just scours the internet constantly for bands. We've also had we've had quite a few people in Europe specifically just find us online. I'm not quite sure how, but I do see that they found us, and then they found other bands that we know. Maybe they just check our MySpace friends. It might be something that simple. But they've after we played a fairly large festival in Belgium called Dranalto. Um, they contacted our MySpace friends to see if they wanted to play there as well. So it, it seems like it would be more scientific than that or, you know. So it's really grassroots marketing on the internet. A lot of it, yeah, like with the European contacts especially so. That is very interesting. Yeah, we've so had those at Vienna Accordion Festival and the Dranalto Festival and there was a Balkan Festival in Switzerland. They all found us online. None of these people have ever seen us. They've ne I've never sent them a press kit, nothing. Now that's an important point. Uh, playing Balkan festivals and other and accordion festivals, so that suggests that the types of festivals that are seeking you out are ones that are attuned to the style of music that you play. Right, so, and that's the one that we target as well. Like we're going to look for accordion festivals because we play a lot of accordion music. We're going to look for folk world folk festivals because we've tried to apply for other festivals that we kind of fit in, and it's almost pointless, you know, because we do some Celtic music but not enough to play at a Celtic festival. So we've never. Same thing with Cajun Zydeco. We don't do enough of that, so it's not, there's not even point wasting our time. Right, so well, I think the great point here is that as an artist, you understand what your sound sounds like, and you can articulate that, right? Sure. So, so you can express to somebody what niche you fit in musically, which helps to target your marketing efforts, because I think there are a lot of people who think, well, I'm a musician, I want to play at a festival, I'm just going to hit every single festival that I can possibly hit, and hopefully one of them will bite, rather than being a little bit more scientific. And that takes too much effort. And but you got to you got to look for the ones that are appropriate for you. Is my point. Sure. You know, you're not going to um, necessarily fit at a heavy metal festival, but at a festival that's about Balkan music or accordion music, it's perfect right, for you. Right. And first, we do some rock festivals, but generally they don't pay as well. The world. Music, <laughs> Interesting. The world music festivals pay a lot more. Usually. Well, and since for the rest of the world, Louisiana music is world music, that's instructive. Yeah. So, all right. Um, cool. Bruce, do you want to chime in a little bit and, and talk about first how the band came together and um, okay. just let us know how you started getting in on, the, on some of those festival gigs? Uh, it was all pure luck, probably, but um, I started the band, the Louisiana Sunspots, in 1991. Uh, and so the first thing I really got into was the Jazz and Heritage Festival here in New Orleans uh, with some help from Willie Dixon. Um, in fact, that's how I got in Jazz Fest. I was, I was playing uh, with Willie Dixon at the time, and he had some pro, if you don't know who he is, he's a bass player known as the father of Chicago blues. Um, so he wrote a lot of songs. So I was with Willie when he finally got his 700 songs back that he had written uh, in copyright 
Um, this was not long before he passed away. But anyway, I got into Jazz and Heritage Festival because <clears throat> I was playing with Willie Dixon, and he asked me, son, what, what day you playing the festival? And he was in town with the Chicago All-Stars. And I said, Mr. Dixon, I'm not in that festival. He said, well, why not? I said, they don't even know who I am. So he said, well, any kids in here? <laughs> We're on TV. Yeah. You're on camera. Well, this is what he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, we're all grown up. He here. said, what kind of BS is that? So he said, well, come on, let's take a ride. So he drove around to Quint's house, <laughs> knocked on the door, Quint Davis opened the door, and he said, Willie Dixon, what are you doing? And he said, how come he ain't on your festival? And, uh, and Quint said, well, who is he? <laughs> He said, this sun pie, you don't even know your own stars in your town? And uh, Quint said, well, must have been some kind of oversight. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So that was March the 29th. I won't forget that date. So that April, you know, a month away, coming up, I was on the festival twice. <laughs> and uh, so I was playing, and um, the, the people I was playing at the time was uh, some old school New Orleans blues musicians. Um, bass player was from Little Richard's band and uh, a couple of guitar players from Jimmy Reed's old band, drummer. Uh, but they had Marsha Ball's band back me. We played the Banana Boat Gazebo. And uh, it was low stage. It was right in the infield. They used to have some water. And it was right by this big oak tree that's out there. And we played out there, and we made a lot of noise and racket. I was a young buckaroo at the time. And uh, so it filled up that whole infield. It had about eight or 9,000 people in the infield, so they had to stop having that stage there after that. Uh, but anyway, that's how I got in, and it was important. Uh, so I wanted to, the main thing is when you get in front of an audience, when you get an opportunity to do something, uh, deliver the punch. Um, and I've never been one to go out and booking like most people do. It's not an exact science. I don't pass out cards. I don't, have, I don't even have cards. But it's not the thing to do. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily that what I do is I, I molded and fit a career to, that fits me and try to wrap around the band that I play. So we play blues, we play Zydeco music, we play Afro-Caribbean music, and I've always tried to create songs that were a part of who I was and what I thought fit the band that has been playing with me. So from that, we were able to immediately pick up some festivals and that, that same summer we went and played the Houston Juneteenth Festival and then we went to Martinique played in uh, French Caribbean and Martinique and a clarinet festival. Do you uh, even have a clarinet in your band? No, but I surely did go and get one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's the deal. I wouldn't say that, uh, I mean sometimes I'll take a challenge. If they tell me to come play a, you know, a, a hard rock concert, I might consider that. I mean, you know, it sounds like fun to me. I just use the, the, the world and the world of music as my playground in that sense. There are some things I would turn down, but I also like to take challenges. So we went and played this clarinet festival in Martinique. We got a clarinet player, Charlie Catalano, and we went down and played. And uh, it was a very, very serious festival with a lot of beginning musicians. And we just took a little bit of New Orleans where we played blues, played second line music, got all those people, and they were very hotty toddy all dressed in black and white tuxedos, and when you, the musicians would play, they would. <laughs> and it was a house full of people. It was warm just like it is in this room right now. And Martinique, there's not air conditioning to be found. So we were playing, and then I said, well, we're gonna do a second line. And uh, <clears throat> I did speak Creole, so that helped, and that was a, a good icebreaker to get in the audience. But uh, we got out there in second line, those people got up in second line, they didn't know what to do with the place. And they, we played the same song for about 40 minutes. <laughs> I'm serious, they didn't want to stop. So it worked out great. Played that festival, Gary was right there from Brittany in France. And he had us come and play a clarinet festival. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, clarinet player Glomel. kept working with you guys. I was all about the clarinet. We played that. <laughs> Played at clarinet festival and I was playing accordion and harmonica, played piano. I was like, whatever's necessary. So I was just happy to be out there. And from that, um, then it, it took off. And, Have you uh, played any violin festival? <clears throat> no, I didn't, but I, uh, I went straight from that into other kinds of folk festivals. And you never know what the, you know, like African diaspora festivals in Jamaica and all around the world. So, I mean, I've, I've been able to 
with our band. Now, I, I did specifically target a few things, and one was I wanted to play in Europe because I knew it was a good market to get into, and they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blues, blues festivals. <clears throat> and to me, that's, that's my bread and butter. And if you want to be a musician with longevity, then you need to pick a field of music that has longevity. And I knew that with blues music, I could play it the rest of my life, and if I do it right, create some kind of legendary status. And this is New Orleans, so if you're working at New Orleans, you want to become a New Orleans legend. So I'm still working on that. That's always a work in progress. But it is a field of music that doesn't go away, and there are thousands of festivals around the world. And blues is the basis for all modern music that you're going to get your hands on. I don't care what kind of music it is. You can run some blues through it, and it's going to work for you. So don't forget that when the a good old uh, 251 or uh, 145 uh, beat groove uh, won't go away. It's what moves people. I like to make people dance. Uh, and be able to enjoy the music, and, uh, and I love writing music. So that was one thing. We played, mm, we played probably about 35 countries around the world. I've never picked up a phone and just tried to call and say, can we play your festival? Um, well, what do you do? I conjure it up. You ask me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Got my gris gris on, don't leave home without it. That's the truth. Um, so you just wait for the phone to ring, or what do you do? I do. Uh, if I want to go a specific place, I, I conjure it up, and I wait for the phone. I wanted to go to Haiti last year. We went to Haiti and played the first international music festival last year. Jamaica, same thing. South Africa, Durban, also an Af Africa festival. And I wanted to go to Europe after I played these two festivals. So <clears throat> came back, played jazz festival. A guy from um, Holland, from Utrecht, they have a blues festival there. He was there, his name is Jaap Hendricks. Came up to me after we played and said, I want you to come and play in Europe. I said, all right, we in. So we went and we played that festival and he loved us. And from that, we played that one, it was, it's a one, two all right, night now, festival. Hang on a second. Yeah. So you never picked up the phone, you never sent a press kit, never you never sent an email, you never did any of those things that everybody I ever still, said? I still don't do it. So, so you just envision it in your mind and, and it will come to you. Yeah, you know, you have to keep practicing and playing. Christian, is that how, it's, we, how it's worked for you? Sometimes. Honestly, uh, like some of the bigger festivals. Well, then we can all go home. Contact us. <laughs> <laughs> I guess thing. the trick is... This. I won't the, keep the, it too long. The, trick is, the yeah. trick is to play a lot and play yeah. well. Play you loud know, and play well? People, you play at big events and people <laughs> will see you there and they'll start, they'll start calling you. That's no, true. being an independent artist is different. It's not an exact science, so it's not the same thing... Um, Websites, um, you know, I, I put up things, but you can see what happened with websites. They, that name was squatted in 1994, Sun Pie. Uh, I know when it happened. Uh, I know two people that probably did it. If you dial up sunpie.com, it's a porn site. So we're playing out in California. So uh, that's how you get gigs. You, turn, you change your site <laughs> to a porn site. Yes, no. Madonna <laughs> said bad news is good too, but um, no, yeah, I mean, it, it got squatted by this, uh, we played on San Diego street scene, and somebody there liked the name, they squatted the name, and they went back, even in the registration, you could do that at that time, and they said that they'd registered that name uh, two hours before I had. And the next year, a guy from um, South Africa came here, I was speaking at an international law conference, and uh, he bought 100 CDs, he was one of the minor prime ministers of South Africa. He bought the CDs, and within six months, there was a site that popped up called Sun Pie Foods. And if you go online, it's still there. It has about five layers of what looks like bakery goods all over South Africa, but it's actually online gambling. So for me, that's been kind of problematic. And it's hard to fight people that are far away, and if you don't have a lot of money to go after them, or time and energy to dedicate to it, then you try to weave around it. So I really just used MySpace, and I used... Facebook and, and do people contact you through the website a lot or how else do they do people reach they you? do but I've always used word of mouth really that's literally it's it's been the best system for me word of mouth uh, people knowing or just seeking you out and I've worked constantly for the last 17 18 years um, and uh, you know so it's really word of mouth yeah uh, to me you can put great packages together press kits but what you really have to do is when you get an opportunity, deliver the word. Uh, it's worked for me the same way in the film industry. I've 
been lucky enough to have, I have about 13 songs out in film right now. So, and they've been out there for a while. The first thing I did was in 1992, and it's still out there. So, it still works. And if you understand how to read a contract, learn, a, learn about synchronization rights, mechanical rights, and join the right unions, um, SAG, music unions, uh, Get with BMI ASCAP as fast as you can. Don't go out there and thinking that if you're going to put some music out and it's your music, uh, you need to have it work for you. So you need a mule. While you're playing club gigs or trying to hustle updates for uh, festivals, um, those other things are also very important. So it's, it's been good in that sense. And, that, and there's nothing that works faster than uh, television. If you get on TV, um, you, then you're doing the right thing. I go to WWL. I mean, I played, I used to do that thing every uh, year, you know, for Jazz Fest. I didn't do it this year, but that's good. Henry Butler did it, because that's 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's still, it's important, so. So, Dave, as a talent buyer, is that how it works? Do you feel a, a, a signal coming in through the atmosphere <laughs> that, that somebody is sending out their Grigory vibes, and all of a sudden you have a vision and said, ah, I got it, sun pie, I need sun pie, and it just comes in through the, through the, uh, the telepathic rays? Well, every, everybody has their own method and their own, and their own practice, and it's a, it's a spiritual practice, and I, I, I hear what sun pie is saying, and, and he manifests what he <laughs> what he wants. Um, I wish I could manifest 10,000 ticket sales by just <laughs> meditating. Call um, me, Dave. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I might, who knows, Sun Pie might be at High Sierra next year. I mean, maybe I'm on his list or maybe I'm in his radar now. And I mean, this, this type of thing, you never know. Um, it's what Sync Up is all about. But yeah, that's, <laughs> and you know, exactly. I mean, People here who may be interested in getting their band booked at a festival, I mean, you're doing the right thing by coming to things like this. It is all about, you know, what Christian did. It's so, it's so much about being visible and getting yourself in front of the people who are the decision makers and the taste makers for these festivals. And it is, you know, like Sun Pie was saying, yeah, you can have a pretty press kit and you can have uh, a, a great record, but if you're in the live music business, it's about your live music performance. So through the 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 viral aspect of how things have developed with YouTube and, and, and uh, the interweb, as we like to call it, uh, it, it's become that much easier to, to see bands on the, on the radar and see talent on the radar. I mean, it's become easy pickings for festival promoters to find talent these days, you know, whereas in the past you really had to, it was, it, the, the, the channel was a lot more narrow, and now it's, it's, it's so wide open, you, you almost have to try to be invisible. Uh, because you're, you know, you're gonna be, you're, if you're good, you're gonna be found out. You know, you're gonna be discovered, you're gonna be known. So, so right, it's like all the best YouTube videos we have are from other people who have randomly right, and taken it, and, which well, has helped us a lot, because now that, you know, there's certain, also fe certain festival bookers I've talked to said they only wanna see video, they don't even, right. because they like wanna see what you actually play like, and that's the like best way to For instance, how many people have seen that, that, the, I, I think either eight or 11 year old kid who plays Crossroads on guitar, who's, Seen that YouTube video? Anybody here? I mean, there's just there's some incredible performances that get circulated on YouTube, and it, it could be whatever it is. It's gonna it's it's gonna find its way around. But as far as find as far as finding bands out, I mean, so much of it is it, it's a it's a personal connection. You know, you and I had a personal connection, and going back when you were managing Astral Project, we were able to make bring Astral Project out to the West Coast, and I don't know if you built a, a tour around there appearance at the festival but you know things like that and, and you you want to you want to get to know the talent buyers and get to know what their tastes are and where you can where you can s sort of match up with them and i just happen to bring a my love for new orleans music into into our equation for the festival and and my partner also has a, a love for new orleans music and he's the actual talent buyer of the festival but i'm in his ear all the time and New Orleans is just a part of what we do. We, we don't have a festival without some New Orleans music every year. So to summarize where we've been so far, it seems that some, some of the, the lessons are do what you do and do it well. Always try to make a good impression. And when you get an opportunity, take advantage of it. Make the biggest noise that you can, right? Are those some of the things that you, Bruce and Christian, that, that you were saying? Dave, you're also saying that it depends upon 
personal connections that you have, so it, a lot of it depends on who you know, and taking advantage of networking opportunities like this to make those personal connections. Gary, go ahead, Dave. Well, yeah, I, so, I had a, when, when Christian was talking, I was wondering, well, why, and when you mentioned it, why are so many musicians in New Orleans independent? Why don't they have a booking agent? Why don't they have a manager who's out there working for them? And I was wondering about, is, is it, you know, that, that classic mistrust of the industry I think that it depends New Orleans on, has? No, I think it depends on the band. Like, we actually have talked to booking agencies, but we don't just quite tour quite enough to make it worth it for them to sign us. Mm -hmm. That's the one side. The other one is because we book the Gulf really well, and that's pretty much where we're based. There's almost no point in us working with a booking agent unless we're going to go really far, which is why we're now working with somebody in Amsterdam because I don't speak Dutch. You know, it helps a lot to have somebody no, I, on the ground there. But I like that's so the far away. Thing. Right. If it's but in the US it's you know, it would be nice to have a booking agent for the East and West Coast, for the Midwest, but the Gulf and the South, uh, we're pretty comfortable doing it our own these days. You well, know, it would help to get into a few places I'm still working on, like City Stages in Birmingham. That would be great. You know, well, some of the closer the, festivals, but like... He'll be here next weekend. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, well, Bruce, why don't you have an agent? Is there an easy answer for that? Um, yeah, probably, probably, you know, bullheadedness and other things, but... Um, <laughs> I part yeah part of the fun for me is to figure out what to do with no instruction I've been a lot of these music conferences I've known Scott for a long time back in the day ABC all those conferences and it it is uh, difficult to to figure out um, if you're breaking into the industry breaking in is is tougher than being in and just working I guess you'd say. But I don't have an agent mainly because I tailor the volume of work to me and the guys in the band, I suppose. And then once you learn, sometimes uh, you know the value of it. If I can book it, if I can book a, a gig for seven, eight thousand dollars for myself, and I have an agent that's gonna do it for four or five on the same venue, then I'm going with me. Uh, and that's not always the case, but it does come up. And, you know, so I work at a lot of uh, music venues here in town, a lot of independent uh, conventions and things like that. That works well. So for me, that's better sometimes than just going out on the road, even you, though you want to spread your word out. But we go out a few good times a year and take tours. I just did a nice tour in Guatemala and El Salvador. It was, you know, it was a State Department tour, and it was fine. We spread the word. The people loved us, played 10 cities. Um, and... Uh, when you do that, they don't forget it. Well, you know, this, this, a similar question came up in the panel yesterday, and one of the points that I made was, well, in this town, I mean, Dave, your question was, why don't more artists work with agents? So the flip side of that is, why aren't there more agents here? I challenged somebody to yeah. name me five working booking agents in the city of New Orleans. Now, Gary, uh, I don't know whether you classify yourself as a booking agent or not, but you definitely have helped book a lot of artists at festivals around the world, do you have a lot of, um, which, for lack of a better term, competition among, for, for pe in this town for people who do what you do? Well, I'm basically a, a, a waiter. I just take orders. You, you find, you know, you have to make a personal relationship with festival producers, and, and you stay in touch months ahead of time. I just, I just booked some stuff for next winter. The other day, by by telephone because the festival producer knew these people and said, you know, for the winter, I'd like to have him back. Okay, so I called him and this guy, well, you wanna, what about that one? Oh, we're glad to hear that and it just happens, but it's a lot of this is just personal connections. And, but uh, my, the, the Zydie Punks is one of my wife's favorite bands. She's forced me to go listen to that stuff. <laughs> forced. And, uh, and, and the first time I heard it, I said, what in the hell are they doing? It was, it wasn't nothing to do with Zydie Co. I didn't know what they were doing, but it was great fun. And, Used to and, more. And, hmm? we, got, we, got, we, we moved away from Zydie Co. Just yeah, kind of happened I, naturally. I, it's, it's probably a good thing, and, and to hear, you know, I see Sun Pie all over the place because he works really hard at doing a bunch of things, and that's what it's all about here, and Sun Pie is helping this, this what's the name of the little kid band? Uh, young, 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 and, 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 and what he's doing, it, it, does, it seems like a totally altruistic thing, but in the long run, this is going to help him in his other business because I'm not just going to see this kid band 
and say, man, they're really good. How can they keep organized? And there's a guy like him who helps them make it all work. So New Orleans is a very small city. It's easy for the uh, European festival producers to come here and make contact. The guy with the club in Brazil, uh, B B Bourbon Ed Street. Edgar, yeah, yeah. Club, yeah. I mean, I tried some years ago to do some work with him. He doesn't need me because he just comes here and talks to everybody. So yeah, that's right, and he'll, he was here yesterday at the thing. So New Orleans is so small, and the music community is interrelated and moves around a lot, so you get to see things all over the place. But one of the things that I, I, I was making some examples earlier, and you guys reinforced them in my mind, I was thinking, like, you need, uh, you need connections and you, in order to bring your independent local group up it, to be recognized by another festival or another business you need to be related and I was thinking and you brought up the Willie Dixon thing and I was talking to Philip Manuel's wife here and Philip uh, yeah, I, I got Philip uh, his Italian gig some years ago because we heard the song on WWOZ with the promoter we were driving from the airport to downtown and they were playing Philip's song with uh, what's his name uh, Jim Singleton and and Tony DeGrotte yes you, yeah, you know those guys and uh, we I booked Philip and the festival producer there is a lot of these people are pretty color conscious. They're, they, it's a reverse discrimination. So I didn't tell them that DeGrotti and Singleton were white. So until they booked them in and then I got him the pictures and said, okay, we'll do it. Well, of course European they. European game? Yeah. Yeah, that's, they've changed a little bit in the last five, six years, but it used to absolutely be segregated. Right. In, in a in a strange way, and so well, I was telling Philip's wife when they played uh, one of the nights they they played seven or eight days, I don't know, but I went with the big time promoter to see uh, the concert in an opera, you know, one of those velvet curtain things you see in Italy, and and Philip was singing, and and DeGrotti and the Singleton were playing, and Singleton did a solo that was just over the damn top. Because that's the other thing. When you go, you better go with your A game. And Singleton just played some amazing stuff. And the, the big time guy leans over. He says, "He's very good." And I said, "Well, I said, yeah, he's pretty good. And he's a white guy. He can play too." But that's that's all part of our game here. We have, and it is changing. As Sun Pai mentioned, it's changing. But you know, uh, the more people you work with, Shorty Trombone Shorty would play the gigs with uh, Lenny Kravitz. Big time publicity. I mean, how it's a great thing. He's just here, and Kravitz is here because of his family and his connections in New Orleans. So Shorty can really play. We all know Shorty can play, but nobody in the world probably knew Shorty other than a few people until he did the Lenny Kravitz tour all over the damn world. Well, you know, Shorty has not stood. Well, of course, he's going to show up on Facebook and those computer things. And uh, uh, that, he knows uh, how to do the Google. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, I got to tell you how we were talking earlier, just telling somebody how crazy. The uh, City Business magazine the other day, they interviewed me a week or so ago about this by telephone, about the Sync Up conference. Did you see the City Business thing? I yeah. did. I okay, had well, an issue with it, but I'll tell you about that. In a okay. Well, I, 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 well let's, <laughs> but, you know, what did he say? Any publicity, right? Any good or bad is good. I, I, I have to learn to shut up on these things. But... Uh, I I was at the pool by the by the by where we live, and I met my neighbor. I'd never met him before. Just been here since I moved back in October, and uh, he works with he runs some of the arts council things. So I gave him my business card. He says, "Oh, Gary Edwards, they just did an article about you. Oh, it connected to you with the city business." So I go upstairs to my office, get my computer, and open up to look at find this city business article, and I have an email from Locobop, which is the uh, internet, ag the uh, aggregator I'm using now for my download business. He had already found that article, and he's in Mississippi, or Jackson, Mississippi. He's a great guy. He had found the city business article, put it on his international music website, and, that was, and I hadn't even seen it yet. Now, how in the world did he find that article? Because he must Google my name every day because I'm going to become his his New Orleans customer, I'm putting like 50 albums on his download site, and hopefully that all works. I, I, we, that's the way I'm gonna resolve the flood damage for me. I'm, I'm gonna have all those, I own 50, I've, I've done 50 albums worth of New Orleans music, and it was old when we recorded it. It ain't getting any older. It's already old, so it's good. And the, the whole interconnectivity 
the whole interconnectivity now. So if you do something here in New Orleans, if you're an independent band, do something good and make sure that people take a few pictures and, and they have somebody who knows how to do the MySpace and the Facebook stuff. Throw all that, you know, get all that out there and you may not even need the booking agent and like Christian just been able to yeah, do Yeah, there's so many websites now that, I mean, I was thinking you have Facebook, you have MySpace, Reverb Nation, GarageBand, Pure Volume. It's, it's overwhelming, so I've actually had to hire an assistant to, to help me manage it, you know, just because it just takes forever, man. You've got to upload all the dates, you know. Yeah, well, all I, these different I, sites. I, I need to, I'll, do, I'll share that person with you. No, I, like, yeah. So that, so that, does anybody like, want to tackle the question of why there aren't more agents in town? Well, I, this is something we, we talk about all the time, everybody in the business. There, and there are some people who have actually done a pretty good job of it. But in order to be an agent, you have to get a real commitment. Uh, it's like a, it, it's a contractual marriage. Right. Because it, in order to promote somebody, you have to spend money. So if you spend money, you expect to get a return. So if the same person you're expending your money on books something around you and misses, you know, and then that gig that he mixed or booked around you may only make, you may lose two or three, four, five hundred dollars on that one, but that one may generate yet more that you can, and then the first thing you know, you're missing all the money. So an agent has to become a, it's like a marriage, and you got to be very careful to guard the the, the loyalty problem. I, uh, well, Gary, uh, Dave, one sec. So in your efforts over your career of connecting uh, Louisiana artists with international festival opportunities, is um, Bruce's model for booking gigs, is that how it works for you? Do you, you know, rub some gree gree together and then send a message out to the universe and, and the gigs materialize, or is there something else that you need to do? Damn near. Uh, it, right. It's well. black magic almost. Um, that's right, it is black magic. <laughs> I, I've been using the term <laughs> black magic today. about this business for years, and now Sun Pie's got some. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's can we get some of that? Was, but, uh, <laughs> No, get your own. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's a very interesting. You know, like, I, I, I just, I, I think some places I want to go, want to be, hadn't been before. And let's see, you look and find out if somebody you know who knows somebody who books this festival someplace, and you just casually mention in an email, do you know so and so for this festival? And for me, it's been very fortunate because some years ago, the uh, European, used to be the European Jazz Festival Organization, now it's the IJFO, International, because mm -hmm. they've added uh, California and Van Vancouver and made it, um, you know, Europe. But I got a chance to meet all those people in a very friendly situation. And so everybody knows who I am. And if they, and they always send me little emails, Gary, what's your roster for the summer? Well, I'm in New Orleans. I don't have a roster. We. We have a whole list of brass bands, and you know, pick you know, get one from Carom A, two from Carom B. We don't. The brass band, a good brass band's all the same in a way because they have all learned. And in reality, all the brass bands are interrelated anyway. They, but it's a crazy, it's a crazy thing we have here in New Orleans. But a very good thing, the mystique, that that we have something special going on. We got to make sure that you don't, we don't lose that mystique because. I, I've had to live in Houston for three years after the hurricane, and Houston does not have that mystique. There's some great musicians in Houston. I was telling somebody, the leader and two musicians of the Duke Ellington Orchestra live in Houston. I mean, and there's great music schools there, and people who can really play, and great musicians of every kind of description, but Houston does not have any mystique. And, and there's some hellfire players there. I mean, I've, I've, well, Texas Johnny Brown's playing later today. Texas Johnny Brown wrote True Steps and the Blues, the Bobby Blue Bland song that sure. we all love. And I became good friends with Texas Johnny. And I, I finally wangled to get him some work in other parts of the country because he's 80 years old. Right. And he I can still play him. and sing. Yeah. But he, you know, he deserves more exposure because he's a legitimate part of Americana. When you t teach Bobby Blue Bland how to sing songs, he's, James Booker lived at his house. And Booker did Gonzo while he was living in Houston because Houston had all that... But they don't have the mystique. They have all kind of musical skills. We have a mystique here, and you went to school here. You, you know, and I think that it's a, besides all the other worrisome things we have about no agents and no infrastructure, we must m maintain the mystique. Don't let anybody <laughs> distract you from the fact that it's New Orleans and we have something special. The mystique is 
obviously there, and the talent is unparalleled. But my question is, it, it, it depends on how wide you want to cast your net. You know, and as an artist, is that really what you want to be doing with your time? And if it is, fantastic. I, in my experience, I haven't met too many artists that are great at what they do as an artist and great at what they do as a business person. Sure. But that, that there, are, there are certainly those unique people out there. And if, you, if taking myself and putting myself back home several thousand miles away and trying to put on the hat of other promoters out there, how active and aggressive are they going to get to come and find? I mean, you're a no, you're more of a known name, Sun Pie, but a lesser known name than you, who's doing it themselves in New Orleans, who's who's who wants to be more than a regional act. You know, they, they're they're inundated by calls from agents all day long, and the next the next and the next and the next thing that is coming in front of their face and on their radar. How did the, how do how did the smaller bands get on the radar? On a, in, on a national, international level, if they don't have someone who's representing them, you know, where do they, where do they get that? So it's there's a there's a rub there. You know, is that really the best use of your time as an artist? And and sometimes it's a necessity, and sometimes it's because you like to control your own destiny and you prefer to do it your way because you know right. how to do it and you you know you know the best way to do it. And Christians found that, but yeah, maybe he the he'd, doors are not opening though. Get an agent, okay? And that's that's absolutely I would do that. I mean, if you're if you're not getting calls to go to places and do the things you want, then... I mean, damn, there's opportunity here an for, agent. Some, for someone who's an, who's an aspiring agent Absolutely. to set up shop here in New Orleans to do that. You know, my question, Scott, too, is, is there a way, uh, whether it's the tourism, uh, Louisiana Tourism Bureau or something like the Jazz and Heritage Foundation that might be interested in potentially sponsoring a band and helping out to, to get, say, a band or two per year and have a program where they actually kick in a little bit of money to cover the costs of getting a band at a festival across the country, you know, there's so many festivals that pop up now, and I look but at the. I tell I look nobody. At the, and it I happens, look, but I feel that uh, an international tell festival in Lafayette not do New that. Would be a, a major riot. Yeah, the, the, too many musicians. The, 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 the jealousy I mean, business you could is make tough. It a, you could make it a contest of some sort or a grant of some sort, but I, I mean, if there was a way just to because once once it, it takes it takes a, a lot to get a band out of New Orleans, especially to the West Coast, because it is expensive, you know, say a brass band. I mean, in order, to, in order for us to book a brass band, you know, they, it, it's, it's expensive, and we can't necessarily pay $10,000 to bring a bass band, brass band out for, unless there are a known quantity they're going to bring fans in because it doesn't make sense from a budget perspective from us. But it's so important to the band that once they get out there, the amount of friends that they make and new fans that they make, I mean, that's, it's, it's almost like you need to do that, but the bands don't have that... Uh, that that foundation to make that investment in themselves. So, are there quantities like a tourism bureau or the Jazz and Heritage Foundation that could help out a band in a in a sort of grant or sponsorship? Well, way? if you want to talk a little bit about what the Jazz and Heritage Foundation is doing in this space, we can certainly do that. Uh, there's there's one thing that's in the offing that that isn't a reality yet. We have put out the notion of creating a travel fund to underwrite the cost of airfare for local artists traveling, especially internationally. So we've got a request in right now to the state government through the legislature to get a very sizable allocation of money that would go into a grant pool. We already have a grant program called the Community Partnership Grants, so we would create a new category of grants, basically that we call a suitcase grant or a travel fund. And so either festival promoters like you could say, I have booked the Zyda Punks at this festival, here's the contract, but we're, we're paying them this much money, but we need help with the airfare. So you could apply to us for funds to cover the cost of airfare. Or Bruce, as an artist, could say, I've been offered a gig at a festival in Norway, yeah. and we, we need help with the airfare. So he could apply to us for grant funding, and we wouldn't necessarily be able to cover 100% of the cost. It might be a, a Yeah, you can put two grants. I mean, I've written grants, certainly, to, to travel and play music. I, the last tour I just did was a Fulbright grant, you know, travel to Central America. But uh, also Arts International, I've, I mean, they... Truly, I don't think they're... Are they still think, up and running? I don't think they're Arts around anymore. I think they're gone. Well, you know, it's all the entities that put them together, like Ford Foundation and, and, and all other things. So I'm just well, speaking out of... Uh, uh, from a historical perspective. But, I mean, there are, there are avenues to write grants or have somebody write it for you if you, if you don't feel like doing that, which, you know, I'd rather lick a hot skillet than write a grant, but... <laughs> 
I seem to be doing it all the time. But well, now there is another resource that we started last year, and we're just getting ready to unveil again, which is called the Jazz and Heritage Talent Exchange, which is a website. Now it's not a source of funding; it's not a grant source. But what it is, it's a it's a directory. It's a database of Louisiana talent across all genres that, that exist. And this is our effort to try to help, especially those artists who don't have an agent. And we can talk all day long about why there are or aren't agents. It, it's definitely a chicken or the egg thing. There, can, can the artist attract an agent who is willing to spend the time and effort for what is often very little reward? Because if you're a baby band and you're not making that much money, then an agent that is working on commission isn't getting what they need out of the deal. So it's a situation that feeds upon itself. And I don't know that there's ever going to be a true solution to that problem. But what we have done is an effort, as an intermediate effort to try to help resolve some of those issues is to create this website called the Jazz and Heritage Talent Exchange that is now undergoing a, a total redesign. This is, I'm showing uh, on the screen here what the new version of the site looks like. And it can show who the featured artist is, who the most popular artist getting hit, the new, most number of hits are, who is a new artist that's getting featured. They can look by what genre of music they may be interested in. And this is aimed, by the way, not just at live performance buyers, but also at um, film, television, video game licensing people who may be interested in a genre, but they might also be looking for a particular mood to fit a type of scene that they may need. Uh, if they may have a, a song that they're looking for to, to fill in uh, a soundtrack for a car chase scene or something. They can, they can search by the type of mood, the key signature, tempo, whatever might work for them. Uh, but then they can also just browse by the artists that are on there. But let's say they're looking for genres. And they... Well, sc Scott, yeah. let's, so let's say I'm a festival promoter in Michigan. Okay. And what are you looking for? Well, how do I know that you even exist? So again, this is a, an incredible resource, mm -hmm. but yet it's... it's it puts all the onus on the festival promoter to find you. Just like it does for the independent artists in New Orleans who are here, you have to, you have to, find, that, you, you have to find that needle in the haystack. You have to be savvy enough to know what you want to go after, to look for, to find it, as opposed to, that's what I keep coming back to, is there an entity, is there an organization, whether it be an agent, whether it be something like this, that is active, proactively going out to the festivals, bringing the awareness that, hey, this exists. So yeah. now maybe you could create some sort of marketing around that where you're going out to the festivals and actively saying, hey, here's your resource for, for Louisiana music. Well, Use it or don't, but here it is. And, and, well, exactly. and make sure and that all the, all the festival promoters feel that know, the, uh, know about it. Festival International in Lafayette does a really good job at that because the people who organize that festival also help book some of the Lafayette bands to go on the festival circuit. I've seen the same names like for Foulet and Pine Leaf Boys all doing the same festivals in the West Coast and the South and the Midwest. So they actually have a good system for doing it. And it would, it would be nice to have that here. Well, the, and, and we're friends with those guys for sure. <laughs> but the, um, Dave, to answer your question, this site was debuted last year at this time. And we spent the past year just trying to get talent into the database. And it's taken us a year to get to where we're at, which is about 200 bands. The goal was to have about 500 bands before we start taking this thing public to the buyer community, to the festival buyers in Michigan. We've now redesigned the site to make it more user friendly, both from the artist standpoint and from the buyer standpoint. So artists now have the capability of uploading their own content, editing their own content, adding more than one song before it was very limited. So now that we're at this stage in the development, within a few weeks, we're going to now begin advertising the existence of this site in Polestar, in Billboard, in Variety, and the major trade publications and their associated websites to get some of the word out to the buyer community. So the people in Michigan and in Oregon and in Hawaii and so on will, will know that this exists as a resource. And are you asking all the artists who are involved in that database to, to link that site on their sites as well, so people... Yes, absolutely, yeah. and just as we li link to their site. So if I was a promoter of a blues festival, for example, if these links work, then you would see that we have currently 13 artists who are classified as blues in the database. And then a screen will eventually come up that um, uh, you can then quickly preview the music from each one of those artists. And if there's one or two or three that you like, you can save them to a playlist that you can refer to later. Um, and then uh, you can come back to them. Or if you find one that you think is going to work for you, here, here are the buttons where you can just listen to the music. Let, let's see if the audio is on. 
No. It's and is there a selective process or any artist, any New Orleans artist? It's a free artist service can, that's, that's open great. to any artist in Louisiana. Fantastic. And so if you find one that you like out of this bunch, let's just pick on one at random, then you go to their page and you find some information about the artist. Man, I don't know what is up with this server. But there are basically two buttons that, that you can click on. Book this band, license this song. And when you click on them, there's clearly some issues. Either it's either with the internet connection or with the server, I can't tell. Well, Scott, um, one of the things yeah. you guys don't even have to worry about too much, the nature of search engines, the more you do, the more they're gonna find you. I mean, search engines right. are activated by yeah, current right. usage, so right. the more, I mean, that, I think it's all great. I didn't know this exists. Uh, uh, so may, may, maybe you should uh, do the offbeat thing, that's what I, and that's what I'm, what's the word, I harp on this all the time to anybody who wants to get publicity or whatever, work on your local people because offbeat is seen all over the damn world. People, yeah, they project it out. Well, yeah. and, and, and yeah, they so do, they get random people like in Nevada saying, hey, I just saw your article. Right. Right. So, okay. yeah, right. work on offbeat. Jan Ramsey's a pain in the behind, but uh, <laughs> man, the, the, the magazine works and the website, she, whoever does the website does a nice yeah. job. They read the letter I get every week. and. And when I was living in Houston, I was paying attention to everything going on. I knew everything from everybody, pretty much. So you know, make sure your stuff stays in their face. Just right. Stay well, we it. definitely advertise there, and that's one of the ways that we've attracted the yeah. 200 bands that we have. So you can see, so we have Spencer Boren's page on the site. And so he's a blues artist. It's got picture, bio, link to his website. And it would show if his database was complete where he's playing currently. So if, he, if I was a blues festival promoter, say, in Finland and had an event coming up at the end of November, I could search on this it, through this database to see what other Louisiana blues artists are going to be in Scandinavia in the month of November. So hopefully economize oh, yeah. in that way. And then once you find somebody you like, all you do is click on book this artist, again, if the server is working or the web connection, and an, a message comes up and it allows you to email directly to whoever the booking contact is to, for that artist. Likewise, there's, there's a link for just license this song. And a message immediately goes to the, oh, the owners of the master and the publishing at the same time, and they said, all right, I've got an inquiry, and, you, and they can interact directly through that. So that's one of the things that the foundation is. So we're working on the travel fund to underwrite the cost of, of travel to festivals, and wow. There's I wonder if there's an airline that, could get, that can get involved as a, as a sponsor of that uh, as, on a, on a bigger level. A ticket, right? Right, you know, yeah. So this way it's not coming out of your, it, it's a cooperative oh, thing. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's South, what I was Southwest, thinking. Southwest, um, San Antonio Inter International Accordion Festival, until this year had to deal with Southwest. The bad economy has been hurting a lot of festival sponsorships, but for example, they're, they're an example of a festival that But I think you know, it's, it's tough for festivals to get, you know, individual sponsorships with airlines sometimes, but it might be really attractive for someone like Southwest to have the Jazz and Heritage Foundation or what, whatever the uh, larger entity is for this uh, index as a sponsor. This way it kind of gives them a broader uh, reach. Yeah, Should we open it up to questions? See if, it, see if anybody has a question for our panel? Yes, ma'am. Contracts. <laughs> Deposits. Deposits. Deposit. Read Deposit. the contract. Well, it, but, but look at this. If they bought the airline tickets, they're going to pick you up at the airport and bring you to the gig and take yep. care of you because the airline tickets cost more than most of our... It, if I been bring somebody to Europe for 10 days, well, then the airline tickets are less. But some, if they go for two days, the darn airline tickets cost more than the gig paid. So, so well, yes, but that, what I'm saying is you're pretty well guaranteed. If they spent $1,200 a piece to fly from New Orleans for six guys, they want you. They, they want you. They're going to take care of you. But that, any of those horror stories got to be stupid people. Nobody, Sun Pie is not going to get on the plane. Well, then you have to be very I've careful. I've heard some horror stories secondhand, but it's usually been pretty, like, very small booking agencies that people have never heard of. So you just got to be careful who you work with, you know. 
We've had two invitations to, to go to Ireland, but I've just not been happy about the agents because I don't have any references from them. You know, so I'm not Ireland's gonna, fun, no. Yeah, I know, but I wouldn't want to go all the way up for a bad tour. There's nothing worse than a bad bunch of bad gigs. Yeah, you know. If Contracts, they don't send you a deposits. deposit and you don't read yeah. the contract, then you're not going to have... Yeah, they... Yeah. A percentage. You, you work, yeah, you work out the percentage that, that you need up front. It could be 50%, 25, 30, 10, whatever it is. There is no real usual. I mean, different people work different ways, but, you know, if you're going somewhere you're not sure about it, ask for 50% up front. If they want you, they're going to send it. And they're going to send the tickets, and everything is fine, and, and that's it. Uh, otherwise, it might, be, it might be 20. It could be 10. It's, you know. Well, but also make sure that your guys give you the correct name to put on the plane ticket. Don't get by somebody's nickname, because I just went through that either some months ago. Just a few weeks ago, somebody in a band I booked from Houston, they just gave me the, the guy's name wrong. And look, oh, that's not his name because I now insist on a photocopy of the passport because that's what they're going to check well, you when have you get to on take the airplane. That. Yeah, don't, get don't, everything right. Don't get on the airplane without doing a few simple things. If you're going international flights, get a little jump drive, a flash card, scan all the passports, keep them on the jump drive. If you lose it, you're in trouble anyway. I take photocopies of the bands, of all the guys in the band, uh, of the passport. I put everything on a jump drive. Uh, insurance, bank routing numbers. If I'm flying over there now, it's a lot harder to send, take CDs, which you can't drag that stuff with you, so you can ship them in advance. You know, I ship 500 CDs to the venue that I'm playing at, and they'll pick it up. And then you don't have that hassle of uh, trying to drag all that stuff with you, but right, get don't go across the Ponta train if, you, <laughs> if the, if the uh, business isn't right on that end and you don't really know what's going on. You haven't contacted them and haven't heard from them in two months, yet you're going to get on an airplane and go somewhere. I don't do that. Mm -mm. We thought about doing a panel on do's and don'ts for international touring artists. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll do one at some point. Do we have any other questions? Sir. Yeah, it's a that's an it's an interesting question. It's always the rub, and it's the, which came first. You know, it's the how do you get a booking agent, and how do, how do you get popular w without a booking agent? And the, the, yeah, that, that that's the rub. Uh, it, it forces you to be a lot more resourceful. I mean, for instance, we just met, and now you're on my radar. So. Hopefully you'll reach out to me and send me your music, and that's you know you're 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 doing it right now, so you're 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 here. You're making that effort to do so, and just because you're not playing traditional New Orleans music, nobody said I was looking for traditional New Orleans music. Whatever your image of that is, I'm looking for I'm looking for greatness. So if if you have greatness, then I'm going to want you at my festival. And and truth, here's your your page on the talent exchange. And as we've talked about in the past, even though you may be a hip hop artist, somebody that's doing a blues festival or a traditional New Orleans jazz festival may not be the exact right target for you. But as we've also talked about, when it comes to requests for licensing of songs for movies and commercials and stuff, almost without exception, the requests that have come to me have been for rap. So maybe the festival market isn't always going to be the right way to go, but the whole licensing side of things has a, it's an also a, a very fertile ground. Well, 
Well, let, let me jump in right quick, though. The, one of the things that's interrelated to this question and then the lady's question, it, if, if Bruce asks for a big deposit, they have to look into his situation. Well, he doesn't have an agent. How are we sure we send him a deposit? He's even going to show up. So it's a two-sided thing. Sometimes right. an agent is, is their buffer zone. They look and say, well, the agent has an office, has credentials. If it's a brand new group that they're or a new group to a festival in Europe, they don't want to send ten, twenty thousand dollars and buy plane tickets unless they really darn sure you're going to do this. So having an agent is that's one of the prime reasons to even invest in an agent is it's somebody that's going to give you creds so that they'll say, well, we can send them a ten thousand dollar deposit and we're going to be safe. And as yeah, we talked about on the panel yesterday, a lot of it, especially the festival buyers, were saying that a lot of it depends on personal referrals. They talk to people they trust for the scoop on somebody who is going to deliver the goods, even if it's a fairly unknown talent, right, Bruce? Yeah, well, that's usually it anyway. Yeah. They're not going to, you're not getting that call anyway. Uh, if, I mean, they might call and check and see if they see you somewhere and they're just trying to find out, but I don't think it would get to the point where you're discussing uh, deposits. And if you need an agent, have one. Uh, you know, they, I don't usually get calls where they, they, don't, they don't know, or if I haven't talked to them personally also, then, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different. And then understand that there are two different things out there, agents and managers, and they're different. Sometimes you have one person doing everything, but, you know, a manager is really managing your image and career, and the agent is just booking gigs. If you, but, you know, things have changed a lot, so it, you might have somebody that's doing all of those, and since media is much faster and easier to get to. It can happen in many different ways, but I don't know if you manage also, Dave. You, you don't manage managers. I have managed. Okay. Yeah. That's why you're an agent now. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> He's a buyer. I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a producer, but I, I have managed, and it's, uh, it's a bear management. It's very unrewarding. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's, that's why it's easier to, I mean, Question. I would think that. Yeah, my mother calls me. I met this guy. He plays me. He's a. Yeah. You know, I, I think the, the, I'm... The, the question was, how do, how do, how do you, re, as a buyer, re, feel about receiving cold call press kits in the mail? I think I'm, I'm more compassionate than most producers out there. Um, and I wanted to make sure, is, is, are our contact information on the Sync Up website? No, I didn't, the, I didn't put your email address okay. up there because I didn't want you to be inundated. I, but I'm, I'll put I, it up if I'm, you want I, it. I, I encourage, I mean, I love it because okay. I, I know you're out there working your tail off and you're trying to find any avenue you can for, for a, a willing ear to get your music out there. So I listen to everything. I'll listen to it. You know, I may not listen to it right away, but I, I listen to, I mean, I have people giving me stuff all the time. I got a nice CD today. Yeah, we've had some success doing cold calling as well. It's, it's but, happened, but a lot of times the festival website will tell you if it's welcome or not. Yeah, and, we, and so for instance, at my festival, we don't take unsolicited, we don't take unsolicited uh, packages for the most part. There's a, there's a small window of time where we, where we do, but now it's all done electronically. People don't send packages to the office. They might work with Sonic Bids, which, uh, you know, we could talk about the pros and cons of Sonic Bids, which is a company that charges you to send their, submit their materials to talent buyers and festivals and the like. Uh, but I still, I love, I still love getting the CD. I still love seeing what the artists put into it from the vision side of things, from the creative side of things. To me, that that that's part of their expression. So I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I take that into consideration. Obviously, at in, at the end of the day, I'm gonna want to see what they do live. So I'll go to their website and see if they have a YouTube video up or, or you know, what have you. But I, you know, that's part of the process for me is finding out how they want to express themselves. So I, I welcome it, please. If you're an artist, 
I'd love to get your CD. But one, one word of advice on that is if you are going to send somebody a press kit cold in the mail or send them an email or do anything, when you make an outreach to a, any type of a talent buyer, whether it's a club or a festival, especially a festival, I have made this mistake and I have seen 100 people make it with me. Do enough research to know the dates of the event and the location of the event. And don't make the mistake of sending them a press kit that lands on their desk two weeks before their event starts. I did that to a festival buyer in Germany one time, and his assistant was very kind enough to send me an email saying, you know, that is the quickest way to end up on somebody's shit list. Um, just know, know enough to know when they are going to be at their worst peak moment of busyness, and then tailor your approach to a slower season when they are ready to start receiving those inquiries. So if you know the festival is in September, don't send the press kit at the beginning of September. Yeah. Right. Send it in January. Go six, yeah. eight months out. Six, yeah, eight months out. There's something I wanted to mention. I keep Give like a time to regroup from last year's festival. And then, you know, my event's July. So November, December, that's the time. You know, six, seven, eight months out. Right. Yeah, it's good to stay really organized, and on top of this stuff, I keep a spreadsheet that, and I check it quarterly about what festivals I'm applying for, where they are, wh how far in advance they book, all the details, and just keep track of when I've emailed them, how I've talked to them, and, the more, and it, if you track everything like that, it makes it a lot easier to deal with applying for them. Question? Yes, ma'am. No, of course not. And w once the relationship is established, it doesn't matter if you're agent, big man in the world, or yourself, independent artist. It's about establishing the relationship. So it's easier for big man, big man agent to establish the relationship with Joe Talent Buyer because they have, they're in that same world every day and they speak in that, in, in that's, so for you, it's a lot more difficult to, to, to aim your arrow at that one particular, that one particular target, say, I'm gonna get there to that guy or that per woman, that person. So you have to navigate more carefully and more consciously, that, that's all. But once the relationship is established, it doesn't matter if you're, so it's all about breaking that ice.
We decided not to work with Sonic Bids for a number of reasons. Interesting. We, we, we pride ourselves on our, on our A&R abilities to find talent on our own. That's what we've been known for through the years. That's what our patrons trust us for, is to turn them on to great new music. That's a big part of our festival. Another reason is that uh, it, who's going who's gonna to listen to the thousands of submissions that you might get from Sonic Bids? And it's, it, it might become a little bit of a shell game, but there are, if you, if you, est if you est can establish with a festival, say, a contest, with a, say a sponsorship from from Sonic Bids, where the festival might be receiving some sort of income, and you know that they're going to have, uh, say maybe a guaranteed placement on the, on the festival bill by a Sonic Bids band, then perhaps. But it's a it's a very dicey situation because you don't know as an artist if you're actually going to get listened to. So I was we felt. We, we didn't feel that we were going to be in integrity by working with Sonic Bids, even though it was an attractive offer to us. But we, in the end of the day, we didn't feel like a band needed to be paying for, for us, just, just, just for our festival, because we have more than enough bands that we want to book anyway, and we book 50-plus bands per festival. Um, there's never enough slots at our festival. Yeah, I mean, I'll, just my own personal... Uh, Opinion, and this is after having looked into the possibility of working with Sonic Bids to develop this talent exchange, and then deciding not. Their model of charging people a subscription fee plus a per submission fee, knowing that, as Dave is saying, individual festivals are only going to have a very limited number of performance opportunities, but yet they're casting this opportunity out to their database very, very widely. So they could be getting 5,000 bands, giving them $25 a head, saying that they want to submit their material to a festival that's only got 50 slots. And I'm sorry, but I can't think of any other word for that than trading on false hopes. Yeah. It's kind of a, it's a tricky situation because we've actually gotten some really good gigs through Sonic Bids. We got mm -hmm. into playing some festivals in Tampa and it's, it's been good, but I also talked to one festival promoter and I'm not going to say who it is, but he did tell me that they actually use Sonic Bids just to make some money. Right. They, you know, they made extra. Money, so the, just so from, the just festival from is getting a piece of that revenue the, the that the artists getting are paying, a piece right. even though the chances of yeah. those artists getting a gig at that festival is like it's nil. Like this, yeah. Yeah. We just, at the end of the day, we didn't feel right well, doing it. Good for you. Any other questions? Okay, well, we've exhausted this topic. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for being here. Please thank our panel, Dave Markley's, Gary Edwards, Sun Pie Barnes, and Christian Kuffner. You know, we'll see you at the hospitality area at Sync Up. Thanks. <laughs>